Good morning, my name is Mark Califano. I'm the, one of the newest ACS board members. I'm head of global litigation and investigations at American Express. I'm very proud to be here this morning. You know, I became involved in ACU, uh, ACS because when I was a law student in the 1980s, we called it the legal dark ages. There were very few student organizations. Um, in fact, really the only one that existed in the law schools that helped develop law students was the Federalist Society. We did not have an ACS for those of us who had progressive ideals and wanted to grow and develop our careers in a direction that could support communities in the society in that way. So this has really been a beacon of light for a lot of people. And the thing I've watched this morning, especially with the next generation of leaders, is people who carry this out, their associations, the network, the people that they work with here, out into their careers, out into their communities, across all forms of work, from public defenders organizations to public service and community organizations to prosecutors to people who work in law firms and corporations. And that is incredibly valuable. It, you can see it now, but wait until you see what happens in the next 5, 10, and 20 years. This is a, such an important organization for this country and for the lawyers in this country. And today, I have the pleasure of introducing our feature speaker this morning, Congressman Hakeem Jeffries, a fellow New Yorker, a very proud graduate of NYU Law School. He has worked, as is many of the young lawyers here, in-house. He's also worked in firms, but his passion carried him to public service. He served in the New York State Assembly for six years before being elected as the United States Congressional Representative of the 8th District of New York. His history with ACS extends back to the time when he was an assemblyman. He has been a speaker at the New York chapter. He's been uh, active in events that ACS has had on immigration reform, redistricting, straight legislature reform, and he has been one of Congress's most outspoken voices on the subject of police brutality. In April, in memory of Eric Garner, Congressman Jeffries introduced the Excessive Use of Force Prevention Act of 2015, which would make the deployment of a chokehold unlawful under federal civil rights law. So what I'd like to do now, without any further ado, is have Congressman Jeffries come up and speak to us, and then we will start the convention's first plenary panel on Beyond Ferguson, a Nation's Struggle with Race and Criminal Justice. Congressman Jeffries. Well, good morning, everyone, and first, let me thank Mark for uh, his leadership, for his uh, tremendous involvement with ACS, and for that very generous uh, introduction. It's an honor and a privilege uh, to be here at this wonderful conference, this gathering of such uh, brilliant and thoughtful and caring jurists and attorneys and law students and uh, professors and people who are involved in the public square trying to make America uh, the best that it can be. Uh, now, it's my understanding that I'm here to give opening uh, remarks in advance of what will be a phenomenal uh, panel moderated by uh, Chris. And so my job really is just to set the table, I think, and then get out of the way. And so I say to you what the iconic Elizabeth Taylor said to each of her eight husbands. I won't keep you long. <laughs> but I did want to just share a few thoughts on the phenomenon of overly aggressive policing and our criminal justice system and how we might move forward. I've had the honor, uh, as Mark mentioned, of serving in the United States Congress for the last few years uh, after spending six years uh, in the New York State Assembly. Justice Brandeis, of course, described state governments uh, as laboratories of democracy. Uh, and I've been able to transition now from a laboratory of democracy to the House of Representatives, which I think is the lion's den of democracy. But there's a wonderful opportunity, I still believe, here in this institution, notwithstanding the 
line up in terms of who's in the majority right now to deal with some of these very important issues in America. I was struck when I first uh, got to Congress, I was sworn in uh, in January of 2013, and of course this was the same moment uh, when Barack Obama was being sworn in that same month for the second time uh, as President of the United States of America. And so, as a new member of Congress, all of us, we had a very robust freshman class. We were invited to be present on the Capitol steps uh, to uh, participate in this wonderful American uh, democratic moment. But since we were all freshmen, uh, of course, we were, we were there on the Capitol steps, but we were seated way up top. And I quickly realized that the wonderful thing about sitting on top is that you can see everything that was happening in front of you. And of course, there was the President of the United States, the first family uh, was right there with him out in front of us, more than a million Americans from different regions, different religions, different races, all there to participate in this democratic moment. But, but what struck me the most was that in, in close proximity to Barack Obama, you had arch-conservative Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia. And right next to Scalia, you had House Speaker John Boehner. And right next to Boehner, you had former Republican presidential, vice presidential nominee and current Ways and Means Chairman Paul Ryan. And right next to those three, Jay-Z and Beyonce. <laughs> what a great country, only in America. But what that scene for me captured is that we've got this gorgeous mosaic all across this country of diverse people come together as part of this grand American experiment. Abraham Lincoln once publicly pondered the question a little more than 150 years ago. How do we create a more perfect union? He asked that question, of course, in the context of the civil war that was raging at the time, threatening to tear this country apart. And we know that year after year, decade after decade, century after century since that moment, We've made tremendous progress in America. Yet the death of Michael Brown in Ferguson, the death of Eric Garner in Staten Island, the death of Tamir Rice in Cleveland, the death of Walter Scott in North Charleston, the death of Freddie Gray in Baltimore, should make clear for everyone that we've still got a long way to go. The principle that was unleashed on this country by the Supreme Court in Plessy versus Ferguson of separate and functionally unequal has been abandoned as a result of the Brown v. Board of Education decision. Yet we know that from the Department of Justice's report, ironically, in Ferguson, Missouri, we still have a, a criminal justice system that for many people in America, in many communities, is separate and unequal. And I think there's no more of a area where this is the case than in the context of how American communities are policed. And I would just suggest that there are three things that we've got to think about if we are going to strike the appropriate balance between effective law enforcement on the one hand and a healthy respect for the Constitution, for civil rights, and for civil liberties on the other. The first is that we've got a problem with overly aggressive policing tactics like stop and frisk and broken windows that are unleashed in a disproportionately 
higher fashion on communities of color. For more than a decade in New York City, we were saddled with a stop and frisk program that was out of control. At its height, more than 650,000 stop, question, and frisk encounters in a given year. The overwhelming majority of folks, of course, who were stopped, questioned, frisked, embarrassed, humiliated, in some cases physically roughed up, were people of color. What should be equally troubling is the fact that, according to the New York Police Department's own statistics during that stop and frisk era, approximately 90% of the people who was stopped, questioned, and frisked, did nothing wrong. No gun, no drugs, no weapon, no contraband, no offense, nothing at all. Clearly, notwithstanding what Terry V. Ohio said, there was, there was no reasonable suspicion that the overwhelming majority of these individuals had engaged in a criminal act or were about to do so. Yet somehow, in the great cosmopolitan city of New York, there were many who thought this was justified by some vague notion of criminality in communities of color. But thankfully, we've got a constitution, and thankfully, uh, we had a brave federal court judge who believed in those principles. I'm proud of the fact that this judge is here today, and she presided over the dismantling of the stop and frisk era in New York City, ruling it to be an unconstitutional invasion. And we're thankful. We've got a problem, but we've got a constitution. And that, of course, is, is why we are all here. But then you, you, you take stop and frisk, and it's declared unconstitutionalist, dismantled at the direction of a federal court order. And then we move to its close cousin, broken windows policing. And the problem that I've got with broken windows that I think we should, we should work through, and again, I grew up in New York City in the 1980s, came of age at a time when there were over 2,000 homicides per year. I represent communities that want safety, that embrace safety, but we also want constitutional policing. We also want to make sure that the principle of equal protection under the law applies to everybody. So the problem I've got with things like broken windows policing is that there's really no law enforcement justification for many of the activities that are unleashed in communities of color like going after folks for riding a bicycle on the sidewalk, taking up two seats in a subway car, having an open container of alcohol on your front porch. And we know, of course, that things like broken windows policing, or what has been referred to in places like Ferguson as taxation by citation, disproportionately target communities of color, and many municipalities are balancing their budget on the, on the backs of otherwise hardworking individuals who are then channeled into the criminal justice system, and for many of them, their life will spiral out of control, unable to thereafter robustly pursue the American dream. And of course, it was broken windows policing that led to the encounter ultimately resulting in the death of Eric Garner. He was targeted for allegedly selling loose cigarettes. At worst, that's an administrative offense for which he received the death penalty. Which brings me to my second point that I think we've got to address, which is the excessive use of force far too often directed at unarmed African-American men. 
Now again, police officers, the overwhelming majority of them, I believe, are, are hardworking individuals who are there to protect and to serve. But no one can reasonably look at the events of the last year, which just represent what has been taking place in many communities across America for decades, but are being brought to life in a, in a vivid fashion now because of the miracle of modern technology. No one can look at the events of the last year and conclude that we don't have an issue with the excessive use of police force. As we saw on that videotape, when Eric Garner cried out 11 different times, I can't breathe. And on 11 different occasions, a police officer failed to respond. Medical examiner says he died as a result of asphyxiation. A chokehold was applied that had been administratively banned by the police department for more than 20 years. Yet something led that police officer to conclude that Eric Garner was a threat to his life. No evidence on that videotape that he had resisted arrest. There's, there's something deeper that appears to be taking place as to why some police officers feel the need to use that level of force, particularly when the subject is of a certain race and a certain gender. And if we're going to try to solve this problem, we've got to confront it in an open-ended, evidence-based, real way. And the last thing that I would suggest we've got to deal with is the fact that when a police officer crosses the line, far too often the criminal justice system fails to hold them accountable. And we've got some actors in the criminal justice system, perhaps because of the close relationship between the prosecutor and law enforcement, who seem unable to fairly and comprehensively present a case before a grand jury that could allow justice to be done. We saw that down in Ferguson where it appeared to me that the prosecutor acted more like a defense attorney for Officer Darren Wilson. Seemed uninterested in allowing the facts, whatever they may be, to come out. Same thing, of course, happened apparently in the grand jury that presided over the Officer Pantaleo killing of Eric Garner. But this is nothing new. One of the solutions, of course, that has been presented is, is, is to figure out a way independently for prosecutors in a police-involved killing, particularly where there's an unarmed civilian, to present a case either before a grand jury or a judge so that justice can be done. Because if there's no accountability, the belief in the system breaks down. Its inherent credibility, which is necessary to hold it together, erodes, and one of the great pillars of our democracy is shaken. Now, there are some who say, well, does America have the capacity to address these profound problems? And certainly, there's reason for all of us to be skeptical in this climate, in this city where Democrats and Republicans, progressives, and conservatives seem so bitterly divided, where people can see the same thing unfold on videotape and come to two different conclusions. We've obviously got some tough challenges that we've got to work out 
in America. But I still think that we can make it to the other side. As I, as I take my seat, I'm reminded of the time when a few young men were, were gathered at an estate of one of the wealthiest people in the world. And they were gathered at this estate, and they were on one side of a big lake. And in this lake, there were crocodiles and alligators and one small turtle. And at the other side of the lake, the estate owner shows up. He looks over and he sees these young men. And he cries out to them. He says, if any of you are willing to jump in this lake, rescue the turtle, and make it to the other side, we'll give you anything that you want in this world. About five minutes went by, and, and nobody responded. And so the owner of the estate turned around and began to, to walk away. And then all of a sudden, he heard a big splash, turns back around and sees one young man frantically trying to make it to the other side. He, he gets to the middle of the lake, scoops up the turtle, he dodges the crocodiles, dodges the alligators, somehow makes it to the other side, gets out, dries himself off, hands over the turtle. The owner of the estate pauses for a moment and says, I don't know how you did it, but congratulations, somehow you made it to the other side. Now you can have anything that you want in this world. Young man paused for a moment and said, well, I, I, I just want to know who pushed me in the lake. <laughs> what am I trying to say? Sometimes you find yourself unexpectedly in a tough spot. And when you're in that moment, you've only got two options. You can either sink or you can swim. And if you look at the history of this great country, whenever we found ourselves in a tough spot, in the aftermath of the Civil War, a nation divided, but we came up with the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th Amendment. Whenever we found ourselves in a tough spot, Plessy versus Ferguson unleashes Jim Crow segregation on the Deep South, but we come up with the 64 Civil Rights Act and the 65 Voting Rights Act. Whenever we find ourselves in a tough spot, the presidency of George W. Bush, <laughs> America comes together in a multiracial coalition and sends Barack Obama right down the street, shattering the ultimate racial glass ceiling. Whenever we find ourselves in a tough spot, because of people like those in this room, thinkers and lawyers and jurists and activists, we find a way to make it to the other side and continue our long, necessary, but majestic march toward a more perfect union. Have a great conference. <laughs>